Ağzınıza yüreğinize sağlık. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ve hemen bir diğer oturumumuzla devam ediyoruz. Hızlandırma programları ve mentor ağları teknolojinin ticarileştirilmesi süreçlerinde var olan anahtar kelimeler. Aynı zamanda da şimdiki oturumumuzun da e, konusu ve teknoloji transfer hızlandırma projesi ortağı Venture Well'in küresel portfolyo yönetim danışmanı Jeff Engeli moderasyonu yapacak. And now I would like to invite the session's moderator Jeff Enger, Global Portfolio Manager Consultant from VentureWell. Test, test. Kahve aramız yok. Bu oturumuzun ardından kahve aramızı vereceğiz. Hemen öğleden sonraki ikinci oturumumuzla devam ediyoruz. Eğer dışarıda olan misafirlerimiz varsa onlara tekrar duyurumuzu yapalım. Bu oturumun ardından bir kahve molası vereceğiz. Onun ardından yapılacak iki oturumla birlikte de artık günümüzü noktalıyor olacağız. Dışarıdaki misafirlerimize tekrar duyurumuzu yapalım. Oturumuzun başlayacağına dair. Let's continue. Devam edelim. 
Az önce de girişi yaptığımız gibi hızlandırma programları ve mentor ağları teknolojinin ticarileştirilme sürecinde anahtar kelimeleri olduğunu söylemiştik. Bu da aynı zamanda da oturumuzun konusu. Moderatörümüz VentureWell'in küresel portföylü yönetim danışmanı Jeff Engel ve sözü ona bırakıyorum. Here you are. Floor is yours. Okay. All right. First of all, um, I'd kind of like to just celebrate this conference in general. Um, I, I moved to Turkey about five years ago uh, and have lived here most of the time since. Uh, five years ago, the idea of having a technology transfer conference uh, attended by you know two or three hundred people um, that was almost an impossible thing to to imagine. So. Um, I think I think this conference is is really an opportunity to to celebrate um, and and celebrate the work that that everyone who is who is in this room uh, has done on on building this ecosystem really from from almost nothing to what it is uh, today. I really think it's one of the the true success stories of of uh, technology transfer and and something that that Turkey as a country and, and all of you I hope are are uh, very proud of having having done. So with that, um, I, I'm happy to be joined by our panelists today. Um, I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with, with Mel first. Do you want to tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Yeah. I would like to tell a little bit about myself. Uh, myself my, my name is Milike originally, but I cut it to Mel because it was really, really hard to pronunciate for Americans in in the U.S. I've been there for 23 years, so it's just um, I go by Mel now. Mel Bulut, Tasiroglu, they call it, Tajiroglu. Um, I've been at UCLA for um, about nine years now. I've been teaching economics, finance, and entrepreneurship, especially to tech people, to engineers. Um, I am managing a program there that they call technology management for engineers. Um, and um, I, that's one of my hats. And the other hat that I wear is the um, technology transfer hat. Um, uh, with that hat, what I do at UCLA is um, uh, help academicians, just like Rana Hojam just mentioned, to have that business side, um, bring the business side to the academicians, especially to engineers and to STEM-based academicians. That's, uh, that's been about three years now when I uh, work for NSF National Science Foundation, the counterpart of Tubitak in U.S. In US. So that's basically what I do. Great. Damien? Nice to meet you. Um, so I'm Damien. I'm a managing director at NUMA in Paris, France. Um, so NUMA is a startup accelerator uh, that has been, that had the chance to be the pioneer in the French ecosystem. Uh, we've been operating for about 16 years now. Um, prior to the experience myself, uh, I had the chance to experience different kind of startup business models sort of related to company. Um, you know, I went from the startup accelerator to the startup incubation, uh, which I think we can maybe jump in a little bit uh, later in the convention to explain what are the differences. But I also had the chance to work for Rocket Internet in Germany, which is uh, one of the most famous or infamous, depends, um, startup studio in, uh, in Europe. So, uh, you know, I went to uh, this, these companies and tried to build ventures from scratch for some. And right now I have more of a consulting uh, role at NUMA, which is helping entrepreneurs from abroad to come to France and actually launch their business there. Great. Hello. Uh, this is Mehmet Onarcan. Uh, nice to be here. I'm glad to be here with all of you. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur myself for the past 21 years. Uh, I was a co-founder of four companies in different markets, different areas, and uh, with one exit to a global company. Uh, and since last five years, I mean, last five years ago, I noticed there's something very interesting and exciting going on in this startup ecosystem or innovation ecosystem. So I uh, left my operations, the operations of, in my companies, and I uh, started doing early stage investment. So I am an angel investor. Uh, I invested into 12 companies until now, uh, all early stage. Uh, but then again, I noticed that uh, I'm just growing cherry tomatoes in my balcony. Uh, I say, why don't I do something uh, with a greater scale? Uh, why don't I do something which will have a greater impact? 
uh, and I found out that mentorship was the most missing point in our ecosystem uh, from my point of view. So uh, two and a half years ago, I founded Mentors Network Turkey. Uh, it is the first uh, mentors network dedicated and focused on uh, entrepreneurship, startup ecosystem and the innovation ecosystem. Uh, now we have over 100 mentors in eight uh, countries, 18 cities. So we do a lot with startups, uh, small mid-sized companies and also on the corporate innovation side. Uh, we had all those companies from the beginning uh, to the uh, you know, large scale maturity in their innovation and you know uh, growth uh, you know uh, journey great so uh, we're, we're the session here is on uh, accelerators and, and mentor networks and um, one of the challenges that we face right now in, in entrepreneurship and in, in kind of the theory and the practicum of it is related to language um, of what we're actually calling certain things so we're we're using words like incubator and accelerator without a lot of definition, and those might mean different things to different people. Um, it's kind of a challenge that we're facing. So maybe, Mel, you could start by kind of just talking about maybe what your definition of an accelerator is, and then in, in some ways talking about uh, how you've seen i at, at, or, or do you see i as a as an acceleration type program, and maybe give a little context around sure, what i um, is. Sure, yeah, what we do at UCLA and um, uh, others do in seven um, other locations in the United States under the i Innovation Core, um, which is funded by National Science Foundation under that umbrella, is I would call it a pre-accelerator almost because um, we are working with academicians who are at various stages of their um, product development, even in cases where the product is not um, um, is not in a uh, at a state where you can spell it out. There's just a vague idea. Even for those academicians, we are there to um, kind of pre-accelerate their um, um, status to go into an accelerator or an incubator. So um, there are, um, there's one incubator and several accelerators that are working under UCLA, but what we do is even before that, um, um, to work with the academicians to, um, as the panelists before us were mentioning, to show the business side and how important it is for the academicians to see um, and to um, pay attention to the business side of starting a company. In most cases, um, I've worked with over, I would say 100 and 120 companies, early stage companies in US, all STEM based, all um, university based. And in 99%, what we see is the Academicians are in love with their technology, in love with their science, which they should be. Um, but it, it, it's a good thing. It's their passion. That's very, very nice. That's what brings them to that point. Uh, they, they believe that everything is going to be in love with, it, with the idea as well, with what they're doing uh, as well. That's the good part. The, the, the handicap is that also prevents them from um, um, the, the market view. In other words, when, when they get, go out to the market and when they, what we say in our core, have the first um, uh, contact with the, the customer, um, um, they do not understand why the market does not love their product or their idea as much as they do. So um, we really, um, um, are trying to show them that it's not about their technology and it's not about when it comes to commercialization. It's not about how sophisticated, how complex the technology, how beautiful the science is, how beautiful the papers written and how elegant the, the proofs are, but it's all about whether there's going to be one customer, one paying customer. Um, uh, Ron Aoja mentioned that 50%, 50%, you know, 50% she felt like business and what I would like to go further and say that if you do not have one paying customer the science in terms of commercialization does not mean anything 
obviously a National Science Foundation in the United States and the counterpart in here, uh, Tibitak is, um, um, they have funds and they've been um, financing um, or funding, I should say, the uh, basic science and um, all sorts of university research, but um, for example, for the United States, it's $7 billion per year is NSF's budget. Only $30 million of that goes towards um, commercialization health. So every year, i gets $30 million and in eight bases in the United States distributes this money without asking for anything. So in that sense, we are a little different from accelerators, incubators. We are not asking for anything back. We're just happily giving them money but that doesn't mean that we're cuddling them and we're sending them out and saying that, hey, spend this money any way you like. We are really, really putting them through a very tough program where we, um, where we show them, hopefully, um, about a seven-week program. By the end of it, hopefully, they see that the market um, is very different from their lab. And um, I think Oktay Bay uh, just mentioned earlier that this also, this, this type of business contact, market view, helped him to focus, uh, helped him to, you know, he was doing this, that, and the other, and he saw that there was this commercial opportunity here, and it, this helped him focus. This is also what we see um, uh, in the United States, that when um, academicians have this market contact, they then go back to their labs and they say, okay, then I'm going to be focusing or redirecting my research towards this area rather than that area. Obviously, not every academic, I'm not saying that every academician should be doing this, but I would like to add, you know, I have some anecdotal evidence. Uh, it used to be the case that um, uh, at the universities, the academicians would be promoted, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, their um, um, work would be, uh, the performance would be um, um, measured by the number of publications and the quality of publications and the money that they bring to the university research money. And it is a little changing right now. It's also um, not only research money and the publications, but also how um, quickly the academician can bring their idea to the, the, the commercial life. So um, commercialization and commercial ability, if that's a word, um, is, is also becoming important. Definitely, and I, I think that picks up on something Mark said earlier about mm -hmm. uh, really kind of the definition of technology transfer being this concept of taking science and research and then turning it into, into commercial activity. So, you know, that, that, that tends to be the the big challenge is, is dealing with mindset and trying to get mm -hmm. uh, a, just a different perspective on it, which is some of the work we were fortunate enough to do with, with this project in the VPDP, uh, mm -hmm. both one and two um, with this project. So that's from a university perspective. Damien, how about some of the stuff you're seeing, uh, whether, it's, whether it's privatized or, or nationalized? Um, around acceleration in, in, in your ecosystem. Yeah, I think I'm going to bounce back on the, the initial question, which was like the differentiation between, you know, incubation and, and, and yeah, acceleration or, or, itself. Or what, are, or what are you guys doing in the acceleration space? So, so basically, I think, you know, it's a, it's, it's a question of business model. Um, you have like the incubation itself, as we see it, is, is more of a real estate project where you can uh, create a place that, you know, like fosters entrepreneurship, where you could put, you know, startups in there. They're going to rent you a desk. Obviously, it's going to be quite cheap, you know, it's almost the same as co-working for some. Uh, but you're going to build up like an ecosystem around that place and you eventually is going to harvest money out of the rent of the place. But you're, you're, you're not really interested in, you know, having the process, the, the start of being successful. <coughs> I mean, of course it is, it is great, it builds up your track record, but uh, this is not like an end point for you. Uh, what you want to do is like having achieve your level of ventability or profitability over your, your real estate uh, park. Whereas like acceleration is a, is a totally different mindset. Uh, acceleration is actually being part of the company and being its, its, its own execution task force. So basically what we, I mean, I'm going to take our example because it's obviously the one I know better. Um, but as, a, as, as Numa, so the way we've seen acceleration, we always had two different bricks that we try to match together to provide like a, an efficient acceleration to our startups. It's first you have the execution and then you have the network. Um, when I 
speak about execution is basically giving them the tool, the methodology, um, you know, like giving them knowledge and content about how to execute faster, how to be, you know, on point whenever you're trying to develop something new, uh, and how you're going to be conduct, like having a good business conduct in front of the market itself. Because I think you, you said it, like, um, there's like many, many new actors on the field of acceleration now, uh, and, and we could even like, you know, subdivide acceleration itself. So you have pre-acceleration, you have uh, you know, ID stage acceleration, you have business stage acceleration, and now we even have corporate acceleration. Um, you know, in all of this, um, and I think it was really great to have the institutional, like, academic point of view, because um, you've been doing a great job over the past years, and, and, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's true for, for, like, you know, a lot of countries in the world that um, universities are now aware about the stakes that we have in innovation and, and how we should, you know, provide knowledge to the students that go out on entrepreneurship. Because it's not, I mean, entrepreneurship is not so much about just starting a business. It's also about like, oh, do you want to innovate or do you want like create a business from scratch because you just believe in your idea? Um, and you know, like providing that level of, of knowledge to the, to, the, to the students and the people that go out of schools to, to be entrepreneurs um, sort of raised up the bar in terms of acceleration. So we are now no more, like we're not seeing any more really early, early stage projects coming to our door. We already, they, they already have clients, they already have a product or MVP revenue. Um, so we can see that there's a trend in the market that you know, is sort of you know, raising the bar in terms of companies you accelerate. Um, I think you know, Numa was created 16 years ago. We started acceleration seven years ago. Uh, back then, we, we had a program that was you know, for anybody. So you could come, just you know, explain your ID, pitch it, uh, based on PowerPoint slides, you know, with, with nothing tangible behind. Well, we would accelerate you. We would help, help you get to market. Um, right now, things have completely changed. Like the last call of application we've done, we've seen more and more um, you know, projects already live with, with revenue and clients. And, and, and therefore, I think um, the vision to accelerate those projects is, is to be able to make them go from A to B in terms of revenue, in terms of clients, in terms of the, their velocity on the market itself. And this is what we do as Accelerator. So we're going to provide you with methodology, content uh, and, and probably business coaching every week. And we're going to also you know, provide you access to a network of people that can open doors for you. So the network is, is really key in our case. Um, and I have a really um, good example about this. So we, you know, like in, a, in a mentor network, we were able to have like different type of profiles from different industry. That's the trend of the network. Um, say I'm having a company accelerated in the food tech industry. Uh, if I'm able to match them with someone um, then, you know, that's, that's has managed a fooding business for I know, 10 plus years that is an, uh, an executive you know, at a C-level position at a really big multinational, this person immediately, if I match it with the startup, is going to be able to provide all that network, all those perspectives, they're going to be able to provide it to the startup itself. And, and, and therefore, your market you know, just expands as a matter of fact. Um, and and this, is, like, this is the way we actually proceed with acceleration. It's, it's both preparing them to execute fast, and once they're ready, well, we, we, we send them you know, towards you know, networks where they can actually um, you know, use whatever methodology we, learn, we, we taught them. So, and I said, like, this is all about you know, being with the project, like, alongside the project for more than just three months. Um, we take equity in those projects, so this is the way we remunerate on ourselves. So we take 3.5%, for example, uh, in every project we accelerate. Um, we keep them with us for three months. This is like on site. So this is a time for us to be able to deliver all the content that we have for them and to be able to match them with our network. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. I mean, once they, once they leave the, the office space, they're still a NUMA company. They're still part of the, that family. And, and one of the trends of the, of the most famous accelerators worldwide is probably the continuity they're able to uh, provide after that. I'm just thinking about Techstar, YCs, you know, those big uh, American names that have uh, proven, like, they, they were the instigators of the acceleration model. And um, they've proved that, sure, you can deliver value over a three-month period, but then what's, what's even you know, more valuable for the startups is being able to just send a message on a, on, on a Slack, um, you know, at midnight on a Saturday if you're having a tech problem and someone from another company that has been accelerated before is going to come and help you. And, and in the end, what is going to remain is the network. And the network is what, is what makes an accelerator valuable to a startups. And this is, you know, how you evaluate the equity you're going to take into, that, into those companies. I agree. That's, that's actually a great segue. Maybe now, Mehmet, we could kind of connect the, the role of the mentor in accelerator programs, either ones that you've been a part of as, as either an entrepreneur or ones that you've been a part of as, as a mentor, but really talking about kind of what you see that role uh, to be, the role of the mentor in acceleration. Uh, I believe mentorship is 
one of the most important ingredients for success uh, in startups, also as well as, I think, small mid-sized companies as well. Uh, and I'm not the only one who's saying that. Um, there are two, I will talk about two, uh, uh, two resources. One is uh, Endeavor Insights. Uh, in United States, you know Endeavor. Endeavor Insights is the uh, research department of Endeavor. Uh, they made a research on 700 uh, technology companies over a period of 10 years' time, and they found out that uh, the companies who are, working, who are receiving efficient mentorship uh, has a chance of 3.3, uh, better chance of uh, growing faster, uh, having a higher valuation, uh, and, you know, at the end, success. And also, there's another uh, report by... Um, uh, Stanford University and also uh, UC Berkeley uh, and also Steve Blank is one of the you know uh, fellows is, who is behind this report. This is the Startup Genome Report, which is very famous. Uh, they studied over three th uh, they studied 3,200 uh, technology companies, and again, mentorship uh, is one of the most important uh, success factors, uh, which can affect the success of the startup three to seven times. This is also well as well in those researches. So uh, I believe other than the money, of course, the startups need uh, investment, the money, uh, either in the earlier stage, like pre-seed or seed capital, or in later stages. Of course, they need to have a good team, a good business model. I'm not talking about these parts. They, they have to be there. Uh, but sometimes in, I see that in our ecosystem, which is very developing, rather new than many other uh, countries, uh, mentorship is sometimes much more important than the money uh, because uh, my personal experience uh, I have seen uh, over 1800 uh, 1800 startup uh, pitches uh, within the, the last two and a half years uh, maybe I'm one of the you know ones who spend most time in this ecosystem uh, and I have seen a lot of teams which a good idea a good team but they cannot really tell uh, about their ideas or their passion or their business model so uh, because they didn't receive or they, they didn't get um, ready enough before they start pitching either to the jury or the investors so they were lacking mentorship or they got the money and then afterwards uh, they don't know how to spend it in the best way uh, in the previous session they were talking about smart money uh, I believe Unfortunately, I regret to say this, but in Turkey, we have very little smart money. I mean, we have money, a lot of money, tons of money. I mean, this ecosystem doesn't have a problem of finance. I don't believe it, and I can discuss it to anyone. I can prove it uh, with numbers. Uh, there is, uh, forgive me, but stupid money waiting for startups. Uh, as an entrepreneur myself, I have been trying to convince some of the startups that I invested into not to receive investment from some investors just because they are not providing smart money. I know investors who put their money into startups, and then uh, after nine, 10 months, they got introduced to the startup. I mean, I'm in a business development meeting with this startup. It is my 10th time, because I have attended all the uh, business development meetings every month. And at the end of the meeting, the founder turns back and says, uh, we didn't met, who are you? And the guy says, I'm your investor. Oh, glad to meet you after 10 months. So, believe me or not, some investors in this ecosystem are putting their money into a startup like they're putting money into the bank. This is not the way it goes worldwide, as far as I know. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and uh, coming to the numbers, uh, there was a meeting in the Istanbul uh, Chamber of uh, uh, Industry, and there were 12, 13 angel investor networks, which we have almost 14, 15, by the way. Uh, and for the first time there, I said, we have at the most 50 to 60 active angel investors in this ecosystem. What I mean by active, doing four or five investments per year. If you are just invested once, you're not an active investor. If you're just doing from time to time as a hobby or for the fun of it, just for fame, uh, that just to have the title angel investor, you're not active. So we have only 50, 60 angel investors. And if we just come down to how many of them are actively doing mentorship, the number goes down to 20 or 30. 
And I said this for the first time in front of 12, 13 angel investor networks, and nobody, no one corrected me. After the meeting, they came to me and they said, maybe you're a little bit object, uh, pes uh, pessimistic, uh, no, uh, optimistic. So uh, mentorship is really uh, lacking in our country. Uh, I mean, within the last years, it is getting better and better. And uh, in our accelerators and incubators, at the moment in Turkey, we have over 40 accelerator or incubator programs, incubation programs, which is not, uh, you know, which is not bad. Uh, but uh, the problems I see there are, uh, it is not dedicated. I mean, you just may be receiving 20 mentorship sessions within an accelerator or incubator, and you meet with 20 different mentors. You don't meet the same guy twice. Uh, so you just get different, uh, you know, ideas, different, you know, uh, directions from each other, and then at the end, you got confused. Uh, I go a lot to juries uh, of the incubation centers, accelerators. It was one in one of the uh, juries that uh, this is one of the biggest uh, and most famous and most successful, successful uh, accelerator program, one of the best, uh, most successful accelerator programs. I will not name it. Uh, but then again, uh, it was a health tech. Uh, the founder was saying that they will uh, re uh, remote monitor the patients. Uh, and diagnose uh, heart disease uh, remotely. And then I asked them, uh, how many doctors have you seen? And they spent nine months in the acceleration program. <laughs> and he said, one. <laughs> Just one. One doctor they met. And I said, and on my paper, I've seen that they've received 23 mentorship sessions. So this founder group, I mean, they lost their nine months of time wasting, you know, having 23 mentorship sessions. And after all, they didn't meet anyone, any doctor, just one. And probably that one doctor was a relative of the family. Uh, so maybe I'm too much, you know, uh, aggressive on this issue, but uh, we need to change this. So uh, I believe uh, mentorship should be dedicated. Mentorship should focus on the needs of each startup. Uh, there are some models that we use, of course, uh, to accelerate the startup, to grow the startup. Well, one of the problems is we always see one-size-fits-all programs. Uh, and in Turkey, we don't have vertical or thematic accelerators, very rarely. So you cannot, uh, I mean, accelerate or grow a health tech startup in the same way as a marketplace or a digital startup or a mobile app. So you need all different muscles, different, you know, network, different, you know, type of, uh, you know, acceleration and support systems. So we need to focus really on the needs of uh, the startups. Uh, in the programs that we partner with, we uh, focus on each startup's needs. I know it's difficult, uh, but the mentorship program is designed for each and every startup. It's not a single startup in this uh, program. And uh, we have business development mentors. Uh, we call them generalist mentors. They're responsible of the business development in general. And we have experts uh, in different areas. Uh, they are more vertical or expert mentors, let me say. So we're running kind of a different program, but uh, we don't say that this is the best you know, uh, approach in the world or in the nation. Uh, we are also learning ourselves and improving it. Uh, and I believe uh, the accelerators and incubation centers in Turkey should spend their money uh, more on content like mentorship training uh, than the real estate. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I see a lot of money uh, being received from government or universities or everywhere, or maybe corporate money is coming now. Uh, but uh, I say, if you just at least spend 10% of that, all of your budget, not much, 10% uh, of that budget to the content, to having a really great content, uh, it will change a lot. And uh, as a, I mean, I, uh, by education, I'm an architect, uh, and also I offer them that if you bring their, your budgets, real estate and you know, furniture budgets, I can find that 10% that you can save and put into mentorship. So you'd, you'd be willing to take some money to, to do this? No, 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 we don't, we don't, I mean, that doesn't have to be Mentors Network. I mean, just, you know, uh, just receive some uh, good mentorship, uh, dedicated mentorship. Uh, I really feel bad when I see all those startups spending all that time uh, and ending up nowhere because they have been meeting with a lot of people. 
Uh, and also, uh, I believe uh, the mentors have several reasons to do mentorship, but sure. that doesn't mean that uh, every one who puts a uh, mentor in their profile in the LinkedIn is a good mentor. Sure. So we need to assess that too. Sure. Yeah, and I, th I think there's definitely been some publications and some research that's went into to the effective role of mentors and mm -hmm. some of the impact that they can, that they can have on startups. So the, we, you're talking about these dedicated people who, who are willing to work with startups and really you know, mentor them and, and, and accelerate them at the same time. Damien, how about, um, how about we transition a little bit into building some of these networks? So, so how do you guys engage with mentors and, and how, do you, how do you identify those people and maybe assemble them into a network? Yeah. Well, I think um, it's, a, it's an interesting question because there's no recipe for yeah. creating a community or creating a network. Right. Um, I think that you know, first of all, people need to recognize themselves into the values that you're um, offering, you know, like basically how, how we did it is um, we, c we started as a nonprofit, uh, so 16 years ago, and the idea for us was just to create a place where entrepreneurs could meet, uh, exchange, you know, best practices. Uh, the whole idea was just to foster entrepreneurship in the market that was, you know, not entrepreneurial at all. Um, and, and so we started like this and, and, you know, it drives interest from people that are naturally attracted to, to this kind of topics or, um, or, you know, like just discussions. So you start, when we started by creating events around that topic, we, we, we try to source people that were early, uh, in that market. So we made them talk in front of crowd. Um, and, and I think like this, we were able to, um, sort of have a, a loyal base of people that were actually sort of the core of the network. And, and they spread the word. That's, this is what, that what they did. Once you have that, those 5 to, to 15 people that are, you know you're sure because they come every week to your meetups, to your events, um, you know, that, that recognize themselves into your values, then you know, they can start you know, being sort of your own task force for spreading the word. Uh, and I think, you know, this, this is how we did it. Uh, it took us a long time, but still, you know, like from the word of mouth effect, uh, we were able to gather more and more people to the meetups, which was really like the, the cement of all this community. Uh, and eventually then when you start asking people how to um, do mentorship, like do you want to, do you want to mentor a startup? Uh, the guy's probably going to say, yeah, because it looks cool on paper. But I mean, as you, uh, you made a point out of this, uh, it, it's, it's pointless to put a guy and a startup, you know, in a room and just tell them, okay, well, th th let's do some mentoring. <laughs> Go ahead. Have, have, some, co have yeah. some coffee. <laughs> have some coffee first and then start talking. Well, and you, you need to create a structure for this. So the way we did it is that we had this sort of uh, interview guideline where, um, so when someone comes to us and say, well, I want to be a mentor, uh, I've been referred by someone from your community. Well, we go through like a, a really small interview case where we're going to tell, okay, well, what are your expertise? So then you have, you have keywords about the sector, the job this guy has been doing, uh, you know, what, what does he know, you know, how to mentor. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, basically goes into a matching database where, okay, when a startup addresses me a problem, for example, uh, I don't know uh, nothing about the, uh, um, house market, for example, or real estate market, then I'm going to have those two words, those two keywords, and I'm able to match them with at least 10 people. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go you know, qualitatively looking at those guys, and we're going to say, okay, well, we're going to pick this guy and try to match it with you. We're going to select four or five. We're going to organize like an afternoon of meetups with, with those guys. Uh, but eventually what we want to do is we want the startups to be prepared. So the startups should have questions. Mm -hmm. The startups should know why they're meeting the, those guys. And eventually they need to do like a small report at the end of the, of the meeting to say, okay, well, should we go ahead with that mentors and have him uh, you know, as a special advisor, even as a board member for some, that happened. Um, and then we know this was qualified. Um, we addressed someone that was actually qualified to answer the, the need. And, you know, and the whole relationship is, um, you know, benefits from it. So I think this is how we did it, but, but there's no recipe. The way we did it is like create event to wrap, to wrap it up. Create event that, you know, interests people in the, in the like the general topic, which is entrepreneurship. And then those people go out and spread the word, bring more people. And if you're able to deliver them good content, then you know, you, you'll see your community base is going to grow anyway. And then you source all the profiles from this community. You try to you know, segment them in categories from industries, you know, jobs, etc., And then you're able to give it back to the startups if they're interested too. Sure. Mel, can do you want to add something? Yeah, yeah I want to add something. Um, you know, you mentioned that one team or one of the companies seen 23 mentors and they've seen only one doctor, one of the potential customers, mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. just one. So also you mentioned that, you know, there is some structure that is needed when you cannot put the company and the mentor in one room yeah. and then have them figure it out. 
um, noticing that early on, the, the program that we run focuses on not training the mentor, but at least giving some perspective to the mentor in n not teaching them, but showing them the direction with which they can work with the companies. I'll give you an example. I have a son eight years old and he comes home when I'm really, really tired and he tells me I have these two math problems to solve. Can you help me? And it's really, you know, you know, the, the easiest thing there would be uh, okay, just read to it. Find a mentor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> find a mentor, no, yeah. just Call solve the problem. <laughs> you know, just add this number to that number and then divide it by that. That's your answer. So that's not mentorship. Asking the right questions to direct him to find the answer is the mentorship. So in that sense, it's not easy to find a good mentor uh, mm -hmm. always. Yeah. Uh, hands, I mean, there's a lot of potential, a lot of people in the industry that have the experience and they would like to just point the team towards one direction. That's been their experience. They think that this application is the best. They think that, hey, this person is going to do the, instead of that, what we say, do not consult, but take a step back and ask the right questions and the company should find where its market product fit lies for themselves. So in that sense, it's also important to mentor the mentors. Um, so that's what we, we also do. Yeah, I, to, to kind of build on that, did I lose my mic? Can you guys hear me still? Yeah, okay. So uh, to, kind of, to kind of build on that, um, you know, what our organization, VentureWell, we, we don't have a fund. We're, we, we have a small fund, but we're not necessarily investors. Uh, but the key asset that we have as an organization and something that I think is, is an opportunity for institutions and technology transfer offices and, and some of the organizations that are sitting in this room is to build out this mentor network, this database. Uh, and, and, and to Damien's point, it's something that happens over time. So, you know, venture well, we've been doing this for, for 25 years, trying to, trying to build up this network of, of mentors, people whom we trust, people who are sitting in this room that have engaged in, in some of the programs with us. Uh, that's where we invest our time, is on trying to identify those personalities that we think will be key assets for companies and startups as they move forward. So another way to kind of look at that is, is just from scalability of the ecosystem, and maybe you can add to this one, Matt, but uh, you know, if, if I were to go out and work with startups, I can work with five, maybe six startups in a year if I want to actually dedicate time to, to doing that. Um, that's not very scalable. However, if I can work with 10 or 15 mentors in conditioning them on how to actually work with startups and they go out and work with five or six, that's a scalable effect, right? You, you, have some, you have a mentor that, that can mentor mentors who can, who can then go out and touch startups and you really can, you really can impact the ecosystem. Uh, again, I, I, I see some of that happening in Turkey um, with, with you guys dedicating some programs now to, to mentorship and, and working with mentors to, to help improve the, the quality of mentorship and I think that's a great pursuit. I think it's something that can actually impact the ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, Mehmet, yeah. do you want to add something well, to the well, kind of scalability? Yeah, you're, you're very right. I mean, I, I was saying that I felt like growing cherry tomatoes, so yeah. <laughs> that, that was the point. Uh, I mean, what, just, it was like about uh, almost three years ago when I was just uh, trying to uh, validate my own idea as a, just as a, as a startup, uh, meeting with several investor groups, ecosystem players, telling about mentorship and asking them, uh, maybe there should be a mentor network. I mean, everyone was establishing some angel networks, VCs, etc., and I was just focusing on the other part of the equation, which was missing. Okay. So I said, why don't we have a mentor network? And just right then, Tubitak uh, came with a grant. They said, uh, similar with similar words, they said, uh, in, Turkey, uh, in Turkey, the mentorship pool is not uh, qualified enough, and we don't have mentors from the industry who know uh, how to you know, uh, commercialize these projects. So uh, they came with a call and they said, uh, uh, we will support companies or universities, organizations who want to uh, uh, do uh, mentorship training programs. So we did one of them. We were one of the eight organizations who were eligible to do that. And until now, uh, we had 250 mentors trained in our programs. I know, to, uh, I know it's not a big number. Uh, 160 of them were 
in this program, in the Tubitak program. And after that, some ecosystems like Adana, uh, the Chukrova uh, Development Agency came to us. They said, we want to develop our regional uh, ecosystem. Why don't you just uh, train our mentors? And then they were following, there were some big corporations who came to us and they said, we want to uh, have our own mentors uh, to mentor our uh, corporate innovation programs or entrepreneurship you know, projects. So uh, I believe into this very much. I mean, yeah. each, each uh, ecosystem and each region should have their own uh, mentor network. Uh, and uh, I also uh, very much believe that, as Damien already mentioned, uh, the mentors should be, you know, uh, not elected maybe, but they should be filtered sure. uh, and segmented. And the, the, the ma major, I think, uh, point is uh, the matching. Uh, in our Tubitak program, uh, we provided over 3,000 hours of mentorship to 150 companies. So there were 150 mentors. We matched with 150 companies. And 35% uh, of them were early stage, 65% uh, uh, some companies, all technology companies, but uh, more advanced, uh, small, mid-sized companies. And after the, all those mentorship sessions, the satisfaction rate from the companies were 98%. I mean, Great. this when we reported this to Tubitak, even Tubitak uh, couldn't believe it, and they invited us to a separate meeting uh, to understand <laughs> what was in behind. I believe the right thing was, you know, uh, filtering the right mentors, and then, I mean, assessing the needs, and then doing a good match. Sure. That was all we did. I mean, yeah. the rest, the mentors did it. Uh, so I very much believe into this, you know, uh, um, developing mentor networks and supporting them, mentoring the mentors, yeah, <laughs> supervising definitely. them. You should all have this in your model because this is uh, a journey that doesn't end. I mean, as a mentor myself, I have been mentoring a lot of startups and companies since four or five years. Every day I'm learning something new. So sure. this is also... Uh, is a continuous process. Right, and that was a great example of the scalable effect. Um, it would be impossible for you to work with 150 startups in the It's a full-time job. Yeah. It's a different yeah, exactly. full-time job. We, we have someone at Numa, for example, <laughs> we call him a CEO, Chief Opportunity Officer. Sure. No, his, his job <laughs> is just to, to network, go to events, meet yeah. people, uh, but yeah. eventually he's going to be you know, able to filter out that, that you know, mentor network. Right and, person, and, yeah. and, and I mean, sure. you, you made a point. Like, it's even more true as the hype, you know, builds up over the ecosystem right now because you know everybody wants to work in innovation. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the case for the case for France. You mm -hmm. know, it, it attracts a lot of people, which wasn't the case before, and therefore you need to be, you know, even more cautious about mm -hmm. the people mm -hmm. that you're going to let enter this mentorship yeah. Uh, yeah. network. And and one of the uh, maybe I may add something else. Uh, maybe one of the problems where I have noticed a lot of people that were really uh, with a good, very good background, either in the corporate role as a, as an entrepreneur. They wanted to do mentorship, but they didn't know how to do it. And if, if they are getting into a model in a standard or if they are supported in a better way, they are more motivated. And also, as the network, we can create some models of working for them uh, so we can keep them. Because otherwise, we are losing those people. I mean, I see, uh, I, I was chatting with one of the incubation centers again uh, recently. They said we had 300 mentors until now in our program, but only 50 of them are left. And three years ago, I told them this would happen. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, you cannot expect someone to spend their years yeah, sure. and years and hours yeah. and hours uh, without any motivation, without any incentive, just, you know, uh, just to be giving back. Sure. Uh, after a while, you lose them. Uh, and they don't see the results. So having a network, having a more, you know, uh, structured approach also helps the mentors to keep them in the system uh, and even get more. Definitely. So I, I think with that, we, we, we have some coffee maybe waiting for us. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> usually that means that uh, everybody's ready to go do that. So, <laughs> so maybe like one question and then we'll let you guys have some coffee. Is there any questions? Yeah. In, the, uh, yeah. Uh, in this session. Hello. Uh, so mostly in this session, we were talking about these micro ecosystems of um, how you guys interact with the companies, with the startups, and how mentorship is going to build up on these uh, micro ecosystems or micro policies, in another way to put it. Uh, and I want to ask this question to you guys, actually, as uh, the mini policy makers there above the micro. How far are you pushing macro policy makers in getting involved? Uh, so we were talking about, for example, corporate, bringing corporate money inside, and um, most ideas are 
most uh, talking here is taking place of the ideas and how to promote the ideas from bottom up, but from top down. For example, I'm a uh, finance and pol sci major from University of Miami, but just for example, if you push a macro policy to uh, have more tax uh, reduction in corporate taxes, this would also accelerate the amount of fund that accelerators can get to themselves. And how far are you pushing these incentives? Thank you. So yeah, I can say well, yeah, something just, just, uh, yeah. like a tangent. Sure, sure. I don't know if it's going to be answering your question, but um, yes, we also noticed that we need to do something from the top down. So that's why um, we went to the NSF program manager who was um, um, you know, giving us the money to distribute to all of these aspiring startups, university-based startups. Um, and we said that, you know, if you've designed this program to run in this way and that way and the other way, but if you think that um, after uh, running this program for, you know, however many um, months, we noticed that it would be better to do it this way, would it be um, possible? So we also tried to do that. Um, we, I haven't called a congressman or congresswoman yet, but uh, I, I probably will that, do that too, I agree. It is also coming from the the um, top down. So, so with that, I actually think that, uh, for one, I'm not really allowed to have an opinion about my current uh, government. So, uh, we I'll, I'll just leave that out of it. But I can have an opinion about the Turkish government. So, I'll do that. Um, I actually think Turkey is a great example of of an ecosystem where some top down policy really worked to affect change in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So. Ten years ago, I was looking at this ecosystem and, and there was kind of some major missing pieces. Thankfully, the government of Turkey opened up some funding to really establish these technology transfer offices and move this whole process forward. Um, I, think it's, I think it's an example of, of an ecosystem where, where the impact is actually the impact is very impactful. I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but, but the impact has been rather strong in Turkey, whereas in, I think, the United States, we, we, we see it kind of from a different perspective where a lot of entrepreneurship, we, we, necessar we wouldn't necessarily, necessarily want the government to be involved in it. Um, it kind of goes antithesis to, to what we believe in. But I, I, think there's, I think there's pros and cons to kind of both, both sides of that, and, and again, having been able to work inside this ecosystem, I think it's a great opportunity to bridge, uh, bridge the two between kind of some of the stuff we do in the States and, and a lot of the stuff that you guys do in Turkey. So I would actually encourage you to, to look at Turkey as to how some of the macro policies here have really made change and affected impact at the, at the entrepreneurial level. So I, I guess with that, <laughs> we should have some coffee. But thanks to, thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now it's time for the coffee break. Yeah. And after we will continue with the Creating Your Own Business Angel Group. 15 dakikalık bir kahve aramız var. Ardından Melek